Hello and welcome. I'm Imran Garta filling in for Riz Khan. Can the fight for democracy ever be separated from the fight for women's rights? Relegated to the backseat of national politics, unable to meaningfully influence policy, women in Egypt are now clamoring for a new political and cultural identity. One woman has watched the history of Egypt unfold over the last 50 years, from Nasser to Sadat to Mubarak. Writer and political activist Nawal Saadawi, her outspoken criticism of Egypt's authoritarian regime has forced her into exile on and off for the past 15 years. But in the past few weeks, fearless as ever, she returned to the streets of Cairo alongside her fellow Egyptians to continue her age-old demand for justice and democracy. Well, on today's show, we ask, what role will women play in Egypt's new political era? And just remember, you can join in our conversation with uh, your questions and your comments. You can also send an SMS or email, and we also welcome your phone calls onto the program. Well, joining us from Cairo, I'm very pleased to welcome the world-renowned, always uncompromising, Nawal uh, Sadawi. Uh, Dr. Sadawi, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, what do you think? Is the fight for democracy and women's rights one and the same? Yes. Why? Yes, they are the same. There is no democ there is no democracy without mo women. Because women are half the society or more than half the society. So how can you have democracy without half the society? You know, how can you have a revolution? How can you have justice? How you can have freedom without half the society? It's quite logical. So far, from everything we've seen in Egypt over these momentous weeks, what has this achieved for Egypt's women? Well, it's for women and men. In fact, when we were living in Tahrir Square, we were millions. And the women and men and children were under tents day and night. So, in fact, all the differences between Egyptians uh, evaporated because of the revolution. Christians and Muslims were together. Men and women were together. There was equality between all. So the revolution uh, washed away all the discriminations that was for forced on us by the regime, by the patriarchal, capitalist, racist, military regime. But in fact, we are one in ordinary life. Dr. Sadawi, you've, you've said before that you're a radical feminist. How would you define that? What is a radical feminist according to Dr. Nawal Sadawi? Well, I, I, uh, we don't use the word feminist here in Arabic. We say tahrir al-mar'a means liberation of women because there is not one feminism. There are many feminisms all over the world. There are capitalist feminism, there is socialist feminism, there are women who are fighting against class, patriarchy, uh, colonialism, imperialism, and there are women who are just fighting, uh, 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 for instance, to change the family code alone. But we, our feminism, in Egypt and in the Arab world is to change everything. That's why I mean radical, to change the constitution so that it becomes secular and all Egyptians are equal, to change the family code so that men and women and men are equal in all rights, to change the culture, to change uh, economy so that all Egyptians are equal. There is no multi-billionaires and the majority, 50% of Egyptians under the poverty line. So our feminism is broader. It is political, it's economic, it is social, it is cultural. It, it's also against American neocolonialism and the Israeli invasion of Palestine. So our feminism is very broad. Okay, Dr. Sadawi, I want to take a phone call from Oliver in Virginia. Oliver, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, Ms. Sadawi, my question basically is, uh, 
you know, with the collapse of the secular regime of uh, Mr. Mubarak and the possibility that uh, Islamic fundamentalists or uh, even Islamic moderates uh, will become part of the uh, of the government of the government, and possibly they become uh, the main uh, uh, governing uh, party. Is this considered to be a setback to the Egyptian woman, or is this a step uh, forward? to the Egyptian women, if we see what happened in Iraq and in okay. Afghanistan. Thank okay. You. Oliver, thanks a lot for that point and that question. Uh, Dr. Sadawi, what do you think? Oliver says that it was a collapse of a secular uh, regime under Hosni Mubarak, and he's highlighting the potential fears ahead of what he called Islamic fundamentalism and a possible setback for women. How would you answer that? Um. When we were in the square, millions, I was met by a younger generation of the Muslim brothers, and they embraced me. And they said, we disagree with some of your ideas in your books, but we respect you and love you. So this fear, Islamophobia, is fake. Under Mubarak, we didn't have secular regime under Sadat, because Mubarak regime is the continuation of Sadat. In fact, usually I say Bin Laden and George Bush are twins, and Sadat and the Islamic fundamentalist, fanatic fundamentalists are twins. The same with Mubarak. Not a single church was burned during the revolution. Not a single girl was harassed during the revolution. So it was the police of Mubarak regime and Sadat regime that threatened us uh, and, and harassed us in order to rob Egypt of its economy and to make Egypt an American Israeli colony. So we were, we were fighting for independent Egypt because we don't want Egypt to be dominate, uh, dominated by external powers. Uh, we, we were fighting for freedom, for democracy, real democracy, not fake democ uh, democracy, because you cannot have democracy under class oppression, under capitalism or imperialism. Dr. Zadawi, I want to uh, read to you an email from Timo Kolari in Helsinki, Finland. Timo Kolari says, without a leading figure of the revolution in Egypt, People may get tired of waiting for democracy. The army will likely give power away over time, but will Egypt be truly uh, democratic? And, and I wonder, uh, I've been meaning to ask you, given that the military is in control now, do you trust the military and do you trust their promise that they will pave the way to true democracy? I trust the power of the millions who obliged Mubarak to fall. I trust the million. That's democracy. We don't need one man or one woman to govern us. We will have a collective revolutionary leadership. So why you are always, you know, that's the mentality. That's the patriarchal capitalist mentality that we should have one person leading the country, leading the revolution. This is patriarchy and cap capitalism and imperialism. But we will have a radical change that we will have collective, we will have collective leadership, men and women equal, Christians and Muslims, all Egyptians will be represented in the leadership as well as in every government in every committee in every in everything so uh, in fact it's a revolution it changes life and i think the egyptian revolution is an inspiration for the world even for american people for Euro people in europe people in the arab world you you know you hear you see that there are revolution in yemen in in uh, bahrain in algeria in jordan all the people are inspired by the Tunisian revolution and by the Egyptian revolution. Okay, let's take another caller from Virginia this time. Go ahead. 
Oh, sorry, this is from Maryland. Apologies. Go ahead. Is that me, sir? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Noel, I am from Ethiopia. I heard you on Democracy Now! And in other times, I read some of your books. I am very, very happy that you are alive and uh, up to serve your people. This Judeo-Christian so-called democracy is nothing but inhuman and dehumanization with the almighty creator, man and woman, will have what was meant to be a universal human right and brother and sisterhood. Thank you. Peace and love to you. Hagos, thank you very much for that call. Dr. Sadawi, uh, I don't need to uh, repeat any of what Hagos had to say. It was self-evident. He's obviously a great fan of yours and the work you're doing. What do you think? Uh, well, I am um, I'm thankful, I'm happy. Uh, you know, my books, I have more than 40 books in Arabic, and many of them are translated all over the world. So I have many friends uh, all over the world, so I am happy to hear. This is my only reward as a writer. You know, mainly, I am a novelist and a writer, and uh, I never receive uh, I never received a prize in Egypt, <laughs> uh, but this is my prize. When a reader, a, a man or a woman, tell me, you know, your books changed my life, or I, I admire your work, this is my only prize. You talk about uh, this is your reward as a writer and a novelist. I wonder, what is the role of, of the artist, the writer, the poet, the musician at this critical juncture in Egypt's uh, history. Uh, what is the role of the artist in trying to sort of redefine the Egyptian identity? Well, you know, the problem is that many of the writers and the artists were co-opted by Sadat and Mubarak governments. They were, they bribed Sadat and Mubarak regimes, bribed the journalists and the writers and the artists to speak for them, not for the people. And this was my problem, that uh, I didn't have a place in the uh, cultural space in Egypt uh, since Sadat. And uh, I was censored, I, I was censored in the media, in the Egyptian television and newspapers uh, but uh, the other writers who uh, were uh, hired and co-opted by the regime of Sadat and Mubarak gained a lot of money and a lot of fame and a lot of space in, in the movies, in the, sen in the uh, theater, in books. They were published. I couldn't publish in Egypt. I had to publish in Lebanon. So it depends uh, whether the writer is really honest and is fighting for freedom and justice and independence of Egypt, or the writer is co-opted by the regime and write for the regime. And unfortunately, most of the elite in Egypt and in the Arab countries were co-opted by the governments, and the governments and the regime of Sadat and Mubarak corrupted them by giving them a lot of salaries and a lot of money and a lot of fame. Talking about uh, the elites, Dr. Sadawi, I can't help but think of uh, the, the former First Lady now, Suzanne Mubarak, and, and the image of her as perceived, particularly in the West, this image of a very polished, worldly, cultured uh, lady, uh, particularly towards uh, the West in their perception uh, of her. What do you make of that? And, and how much of a disconnect was, was there between between that and, and real life in Egypt? The same as Jihani Sadat, uh, the so-called first lady, and Suzanne Mubarak, the first lady, and all the queens in the Arab world and in other countries, those women had no character. They were uh, the image of their husband. They applied the policy of their uh, husband, of their dictator, 
the husband. Uh, so, and also those women, especially uh, Suzanne Mubarak, she killed the women movement. She killed the feminist movement in Egypt. She banned our associations. We tried to, several times, to establish the Egyptian Women Union, because unity is power. And without unity between women, we cannot have our rights. Uh, so she killed it, and she just uh, established what she called NGO, which, which was governmental, and her National Women Council, which did nothing to women, completely the opposite. So in fact, now we are starting again to reestablish the Egyptian Women Union to have political power so that we can protect our rights even inside the revolution. Because we know that in history, women's rights are ignored even after the revolutionary uh, uh, is finished, then women's rights are not uh, are ignored. So we are rebuilding our Egyptian Women Union to have the political and the economic and cultural and social power to, to, to protect our rights. Okay, let's take another phone call now, Dr. Sadawi, this time from uh, Muna in Qatar. Muna, go ahead. Yes, hello. Hi. Yes, um, I have a question for the doctor. Now, I was very, very interested in her writing. She has totally and completely changed my life with her wonderful work, and I wanted to thank her and tell her how much I've appreciated all the wonderful addition to literature that she's given us. But my question was from uh, was kind of to support her feministic point of view, and I was wondering that with all the changes that the revolution has brought on to us today, do you have this kind of belief that there's a possibility for a woman to be the president of Egypt someday, okay. possibly now? Okay. Well, no, thanks a lot for that. Great point that you make. Uh, Dr. Sadawi, uh, Muna's point that can you possibly see a woman leader in Egypt in the future? Right now, when two people talk about uh, potential presidential candidates or potential uh, leaders of Egypt, they talk about George Ishaq, they talk about Ayman Noor, Mohammed al Barade, but there seems to be no mention of any female figures at all. Is there a possibility of it happening now or in, if in the future, when? Of course, now. In fact, I presented my name against Mubarak in the presidential elections in 2005. Uh, uh, I, w I wanted to, to run the elections uh, as a sim uh, symbolically, just to say uh, a woman can do it against Mubarak. But the police was running after me and prevented me from any meeting in order to, I published my program. Uh, in one of the um, oppositional papers, but the, the regime prevented me from talking to people or having meetings or explaining my program. So I am sure I met wonderful young men and women uh, in, in Tahrir Square, and uh, anyone can be a president. Any woman whom I met, uh, there, there were some very mature, efficient, uh, educated women, uh, revolutionary in Tahrir Square, and there were men also. So why not, I, uh, uh, my article will come tomorrow in El Masri Liom. I write every Tuesday an article in El Masri Liom, and I'm writing. I will suggest the name of some of the women whom I met in Tahrir Square to be president. Those. Those are the women and men who deserve to be president, not Isha, uh, George Isha or Ayman Noor or Amr Musa or Baradei or Ahmed Zouil or any of those men who most of them worked with Mubarak regime and now they come and want also to, to, to be elected. So uh, this is the revolution of the young, mature, efficient, educated men and women in Egypt, and one of them should be the president. Dr. Sadawi, among the issues you've so admirably fought against over the years, one of them is 
uh, female uh, circumcision or, or genital mutilation uh, isn't one of the obvious questions that given that uh, societal problems such as those uh, have their roots in culture and not politics and that any immediate change of regime won't have any immediate effect on on solving some of those deeper cultural problems in the country uh, no they will have the revolution is political cultural social economic and it will change the basis of the patriarchal class system and will change culture and will change will change also morality uh, uh, in fact uh, female genital mutilation and also male I was fighting as a doctor as a medical doctor for more than half a century against cutting children because it's very dangerous to cut any male or female child under so-called religious or uh, or any slogan I've been fighting against that and the government I lost even my job in the Ministry of Health because of that and I was banned because of that and then uh, uh, the, the Egyptian uh, government issued a law only a few years ago maybe in 2008 three years ago they issued a law prohibiting female circumcision. And you know what happened? I was never invited to any conference on female circumcision in Egypt organized by Suzanne Mubarak. <laughs> so they, they tried to bury my history and to say that Suzanne Mubarak, the first lady, is the heroine of eradication of female circumcision in Egypt. This is natural, you know, <laughs> but everybody didn't forget so uh, but also uh, before I finish that I would like to say also we need to fight also male circumcision because this is something that people are silent about it and I have seen from my medical profession how young male children infants because they do it when the child is eight days how they suffer the pain the bleeding and the risk of life so we need, we need this to be known, not only eradication of female circumcision. Uh, Dr. Sadawi, you, you mentioned that uh, the judiciary had issued a law uh, banning female circumcision and that uh, perhaps Suzanne Mubarak wanted to take uh, the credit ahead of you and others. I wonder about the judiciary because just last year we saw them pave the way for the first women judges in Egypt. Um, a court had thrown out a case against you in, in 2001 where a lawyer tried to get your husband to divorce you because the lawyer claimed that you were outside of the fold of Islam. Uh, do you feel that the judicial system is one of the few institutions that perhaps should be maintained as it is in Egypt or does that have to be thrown out of the window as well? Uh, it has to be changed. But this trials were, uh, were not really in the heart of the syst um, ju judice, <laughs> system of Egypt because we have very good judges. I won all my cases because it was not the only trial. Uh, the Mubarak regime was collaborating with the fanatic fundamentalist groups to put free thinkers on trial and threaten them okay. because we were a threat by our, yes, we were Doc a threat to the regime. Do Dr. Sadawi, I, I'm terribly sorry, but I have to interrupt you. I would have loved for this to, to go on and on. And we have been inundated with phone calls as well, and I regret that we can't uh, use them all. Uh, but we have run out of time. Dr. Nawala Sadawi, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us here on The Riz Show. And thank you for being with us. Remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and see what we're up to there. You can give us your feedback on the show and post your questions and your comments. And on the next show, Defining the Revolution, what lies in store for Egypt and Tunisia after their leaders were forced from power? And how are those developments playing out in the rest of the Arab world? Make sure to tune in for that. See you next time.